Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear participants. Uh, my name is Andrei Sharonov, and uh, I am a moderator of our uh, sessions uh, regarding uh, the education. And let me start from presentation uh, introduction of our uh, honorable speakers. Uh, I will start with Ehud uh, Al Shaikh. Al Sheikh. Uh, she is school governor, uh, London Borough of uh, Hounslow, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, Marlene Kunurbaev, uh, professor, Moscow State University, uh, Russia. Mikhaili Notari, uh, professor, uh, Bern University of uh, Teacher Education from Switzerland. Sandeep uh, uh, Pachpant, chairman, ASM Group of Institutes, India and uh, Jim Yuan, co-founder, Joy View Education uh, from uh, China, Philippines, and the United, United States. Uh, we will try to be uh, uh, interesting and not boring and uh, brief. And uh, let me start uh, uh, from uh, Hood al-Sheikh. Uh, uh, she would like to tell a few words um, uh, about uh, what's currently happening in the field uh, regarding the confusion between this, uh, this, uh, digitizing and digit uh, digitalizing education by highlighting the difference between these two very close, uh, uh, my opinion, uh, term. Please, Hood. Uh, hi all, and thank you for uh, having me here. And uh, what happened, happened during the past few months in the uh, COVID-19 uh, unprecedented crisis that no one had anticipated, and the switch to online education was sudden. Uh, unfortunately, uh, schools, teachers, and students are uh, unevenly prepared to face this uh, change or challenge. And from my practical perspective, most of educational institutions are working on digitizing education, uh, either to continue the formal education or to fill in the learning gap and to regain the loss of skills. Uh, when speaking about digitizing, I'm referring to the format of the content, the delivery of the content. Uh, in other words, um, uh, the, the converting to digital form, uh, such as uh, from uh, pen and paper to keyboard and pa uh, tablets. Um, even in classrooms now, uh, the instruction, the teaching are delivered through online platforms such as uh, Microsoft, Google Classroom, uh, Zoom sometimes, uh, it depends on the institution. And um, all these are just delivery medium. Uh, but not the digitalization of uh, education. Digitalization is a completely different scope. Uh, it is about constructing a rich virtual learning environment that allows students and teachers to customize their experiences with every resource they have. Uh, when I say resource, it's about the uh, apps, uh, video games, uh, online learning platforms, assessment platforms, whatever they have. Uh, let's take, for example, um, uh, a curriculum design or even a book design. Uh, we could include in digitalizing um, a book design, uh, we can include um, animations, videos, uh, interactive quiz quizzes, uh, collaborative activities, adaptive testing, even games for each section rather than just a plain digital book or a plain uh, uh, lesson. Uh, still, all this should be in a very uh, thin a structured environment that is different from the traditional classroom environment. And uh, this should come, of course, in a, a synchronistic learning option for the students. I think we all know how devastating is that uh, our faces are glued uh, to a screen for uh, many hours okay, at a time. Uh, imagine your kids doing that. Uh, so uh, I find the most important aspect in learning is uh, communication and collaboration, engagement, uh, whether it's a distant, hybrid, or even classroom. So by digitalizing learning, we're facing the challenge of designing the instruction that promotes this kind of active learning rather than passive. And uh, 
I believe that um, we can really enhance the learning outcomes if we treat this experience as a, an opportunity to do that. Um, as a part of the new normal, uh, we need to be thinking or rethinking how to use this technology uh, or how you use the technology in a better way. Uh, for the rekindling education, what we need to rethink is strategies, a, a full-fledged strategy of digital transformation for from the top of the pyramid. And the switch should be uh, treated as a whole transformation program, which starts from strategizing, setting goals, planning, uh, and the full utilization of the digital uh, capabilities. Uh, all this, of course, is to enhance the learning experience for our kids and even our uh, teachers. Uh, I believe the questions here uh, are, how can we establish this kind of environment where our students can flourish, engage, and learn by doing? And how can we help them to walk through this decentralized digital learning environment? Microphone, microphone, microphone. Sorry, I mean, you are very brief. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, a couple of minutes uh, more. Dear colleagues, do you have some uh, questions uh, or ideas? Uh, or uh, maybe some opposite ideas uh, about uh, who just has mentioned. Let me... Martin, yes, uh, sure. Please. Yes, a very brief, a very brief question, Ahut. Thank you very much for, for, for the presentation, first of all. But all methods that you are using, sometimes uh, they have value only if the outcome is good. Therefore, who is judging, actually, the results of your education using all sorts of those means that you're mentioning there here? For example, you can make your lessons and your classes very interesting, but it's, it's just a matter of entertainment very often, not a matter of practice. The class may, the, the, yes, the class may be entertaining, but actually in real life, in business, in real life, it may have very little value. How do you check that? It is when you take it as a full program integration. You know, the technology can help you in, uh, in recording the outcomes. It's, it can't help you to judge or measure but it can help you in recording these kind of outcomes and to compare between them. You cannot, you cannot do something in bits and pieces. You need to take it as a whole, to strategize from the beginning. And when you strategize, you will set for the assessment and measurement. And this won't be like at the end. It will be in each step of this kind of uh, implementation or even the lesson. So uh, what I was talking about is not the... Um, uh, the fun. It's about how can we attract and how can we get this, uh, uh, the learning experience, we take it as a whole. For example, we have the digitizing, uh, uh, sorry, the transformation program. Uh, there will be uh, parts or aspects of it. One of it is the assessment. One of it is the curriculum. One of it is the teacher's uh, training. One of it, uh, of it is the uh, students. So, all these are going to be integrated together and we then we are going to uh, judge the outcomes as, as you said it's just a tool but how can we use the tool sorry yeah uh, please uh, michele i would like to support the Ahud's uh, statement by saying you know actually you're asking for the outcome Martin, the outcome of uh, which is useful for a manager but actually by creating such a digitalized environment you have a lot of activities which are ongoing during the learning process which are like negotiation argumentation conflict resolution and these are actually a very con concise and very important outcome for all the the, the target group you are mentioning a, a, ma a manager must be able to do that and what better if you can learn it at school in a in a closed environment where the company doesn't lose millions of dollars. So I think the outcome is precise. You just don't have like an amount of words learned, but you have a process or something which has been acquired during this learning process, which is very fruitful for his common goal as a manager or his common job. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with you. It's like for we are talking about kids and brains and learning. So it's like the outcomes varies from... Uh, it depends on the experience and, as you said, the process. 
Yeah, uh, it, it seems to me that the uh, problem or issue of assessment is not something specific for this particular moment. Uh, it's a uh, uh, very important top topic for uh, any moment, uh, any period of uh, uh, education of in, an institution. Uh, Sandeep, yeah, uh, do you have a question or uh, intervention? Uh, see, when we are talking of the use of technology, I think we should not forget the human element, which cannot be overlooked at all. Uh, yes, blended and hybrid modules where we adapt some technology into the teaching are going to be very helpful. But I don't see that a 100% technology thing coming up as yet. Uh, in fact, uh, we are, uh, I'm, I'm an alumni of Harvard and I got to even see the classroom of the future at Harvard, what they have done. And they have come up with an amazing kind of a classroom, which gives almost 80, 90 percent of what you would get in an actual classroom. You in mean fact, uh, a virtual uh, classroom yes, or physical yes. one? Virtual. The virtual one. So they have a virtual one. Uh, ironically, we found ourselves to be more attentive in that classroom because everyone can see us uh, instead of uh, <laughs> the people facing uh, all the students are facing us and they have some AI tools in the background. But even then, when we look at an executive education program, we would prefer to be there in a physical mode because then the bonding is much better. Uh, when you look at knowledge creation, when you look at uh, you know, the skills transfer and aptitude, maybe the knowledge transfer can happen online. But the, for the other things, the face to face interaction is necessary. In fact, for the first time in the history of Harvard, they have had 30% students deferring their admissions because they want to do it in the physical mode. So uh, yes, technology is very important, but if you adapt and have hybrid modes or uh, uh, blended modes, I think right. that's the way to go. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, Mark Lien, uh, Mark Lien Konurbaev, uh, you do represent the Moscow State University, one of the oldest institutions, uh, at least in, in Russia. 170 years old, something like this. And uh, as you mentioned, you would like to tackle with the uh, uh, matter of, uh, pri pri uh, I'm sorry, the broader scale of educational landscape, focusing primarily on end users of the university product. What is the modern society expect from the university graduates and how the old education solutions suit uh, these expectations? Okay, Mark Ben, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, for giving me the, me the floor. I would like first very briefly to say about myself. Uh, I worked in very different forms and institutions and organizations. For example, well, I worked as a professor of Moscow State University for 30 years. Simultaneously, I am professor and academic supervisor for financial university in Russia. Therefore, I have this aspect as well. I worked for nearly 10 years for Deloitte and Touche as a senior manager for, for document production. I worked for The Economist magazine as a researcher. Uh, so I also have my own businesses. So I, have, I am a startup. Therefore, I see uh, simultaneously different aspects of working as an educator on the one, that's on the one hand and as a, as a user, as an end user of the education product. Therefore, I see all the pains that I have as an end user, the consumer of the product of education. And I will say my pain is the following. For example, when I'm, uh, when I'm preparing uh, and training translators and, uh, uh, and editors, when they come and work in big companies like Deloitte, for example, they're, from my point of view, they're underqualified. And I begin to ask myself a question, why do I need to spend since six months more bringing up their qualification to the desired level? And very often it happens that uh, people still are unsuitable for, for desirable positions, very often. And very often we actually we lose, we, we waste a lot of money uh, upgrading people who are not upgradable. And uh, in this case, you say, what should we do in the institutions? Do we as educators inside the institution need to do something in order to make our product more suitable for the, for, for the needs of business, for the needs of governments, for the needs of societies inside? Uh, inside our organizations. And I noticed very generally that from my point of view, big universities or, or red brick universities or Ivy League universities, I think traditional, uh, traditional universities, yes, I think they're too big 
actually, and they're, and they're too encompassing in our societies. And I think there is the excessive attention of the young generation to, to these universities. Uh, I think with an increasing rise of technologies, people need to focus more on uh, being, uh, being in demand for concrete purposes rather than being generally available. In this sense, I would say that university, in the proper sense of the word, the organization that is providing university education should, should actually lose part of its market. It should, it should start focusing on a limited number of people who would be leaders, who will be defining the strategy, who will be defining the philosophy. And these people are in great demand, of course, in the, in the topical positions. But we don't need hundreds of thousands of such graduates. We need only, only a limited number of these people. In this sense, for example, when a university like Moscow has about 80,000 students, for example, or well, from 60,000 to, 60, to 80,000 students, I think it may be much, uh, much greater in demand if it prepares, let's say, 15,000 students, but focusing more on these people and providing a, 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 a high quality product at the end, rather than uh, inviting so many students and uh, ending up with only, I don't know, 5% of quality. Mark, yeah. Mark, I, I, I do suspect that uh, your dean or your president of the university would not support you in this particular moment. They would, they uh, would, they would, they, they would. would. I, I, I know Viktor Antonovich, and uh, well, I know I know how he how he thinks about that. And I have lots to say, but I'm, I will not be. Well, I've been in in, in communication with Viktor Antonovich for Sadovnichi, uh, uh, vice chancellor. Yeah. Many times, so I, I know what he thinks about, and I know his plans and strategy. Uh, to a certain extent, he's supportive. To a certain extent, but not uh, not fully. Um, I think uh, people, uh, those uh, pupils who finish schools, I think they should be focusing more on colleges. Meaning, they should spend some time in real life in practicing, so that they would know later on how they would fare better in a bigger world. If they start focusing on some small profession, uh, knowing their skills, knowing how they develop their skills, maybe after one or two years of practical life, they would know better how to develop as leaders already, as strategy makers. Therefore, in this sense, I would give greater, uh, greater share to colleges, to research institutions, to those people who are providing the project-based education rather than general education. And I think, well, uh, as I said, the traditional universities should be preserved, of course, but should stand above everything else. It is something to which people are aspiring to come to at the end of the day. Therefore, uh, well, in my short representation, I have barely one minute left. Uh, I think uh, the balance of educational institutions in the society should be reconsidered. Traditional, uh, uh, traditional institutions should, be, should, should occupy a smaller share of the market, but a greater value, a greater value, while colleges and project-based institutions should be, should occupy greater place because we have technology in place, we have digital technologies, we have, we have more and more robots coming into our lives. Therefore, well, somebody needs, needs to serve these parts. And the same issue is the so-called uh, corporate education, where companies are upgrading their employees to make them suit their purposes better. So in my, well, summing up, in my idea, the college and project-based education should be in greater demand right now, while traditional universities should be a smaller share, but greater value at the end of the day. This is very briefly what I, that's how I think about that. Uh, thank, thank you, Mark Len. Uh, may I just ask a question? Is it possible to get all these three institutions all together as a part of uh, one big entity? Absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with you. As we said, uh, one of the founders of Moscow State University, Mikhail Lomonosov, he said that the university without lyceum is the same as, as the field without seeds. Therefore, a university may ex a traditional university may exist as a center, as an educational center, having colleges around, lyceums around, project-based institutions around, each of them serving its own purpose. It should work as a big system-based uh, organization. Therefore, not, not just, uh, as, we say, but, uh, as, as we say, the Ebony Tower standing aside for, for only just uh, topical people, but as a system of systems. In that particular case, it will work brilliantly from my point of view. Thank you. Uh
Colleagues, please, your questions, your interven in interventions. Uh, Jim, please. Yeah, just it's really good points, Mark. And I, I want to uh, just ask a couple open questions uh, in part uh, to build on your excellent points. And, uh, you know, it, what, the one question would be, what, what is what how do we define as the purpose of the higher education? Is it for the pursuit of knowledge? Is it for, the, for research or is it more for vocational training? And, and that, that kind of it, it's, it's kind of it, it, there's that conflict oftentimes between the two. And you make a good point about how maybe colleges can serve both functions or, or have, a, have a dual purpose. Um, although it, it can be also argued that uh, there are also other institutions outside of colleges that, that are beginning to more and more so take on the role of vocational training, especially on an online basis as well. Thank you, Jim. It's, it's, it's a very interesting uh, Mark, question. Uh, just, uh, sorry, just for a second. Uh, please uh, pay attention uh, on questions. Uh, do you see questions? Uh, I mean, uh, all participants, please look uh, on these questions. And uh, probably, Hood, uh, the first one uh, you, you could uh, answer. You, you could try. Mark Lane, please. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, Jim, the question that you are asking is one of the topical questions. Uh, and I will explain why. Uh, I will say... Uh, Val, uh, Warren Buffett repeatedly said that we are living in the value-based economy. It's a value-based economy, and education is also part of the value-based economy. The big question that we are asking ourselves, what sort of value we are generating in educational institutions? People, technologies, employees, what is our end product at the end of the day? I would say that we are, we are, we are standing right now at the turn of, of civilizations, meaning our civilization is becoming different. And if in the past civilization we were thinking more of man as the center of civilization, we are increasingly start begin to think of a new civilization as centered around technology, not, uh, more a machine-like uh, center that is picking up from humans everything that is possible and making it valuable for, for people. In this sense, educational institutions, I think they should be not so much generating knowledge but generating people who are capable of sustaining the new law of life. If the old civilization was thinking of preserving the old system, preserving the old knowledge, preserving the traditional knowledge, like Kant, Descartes, and uh, Aristotle, and so on and so forth, the new system thinks about teaching young people how to either create the new law or to sustain the existing law or to introduce the new, new law of life. Educators, I think, should have this in the center of their attention. Uh, thank you, Mark Lynn. And uh, uh, probably uh, we are very <laughs> close to the topic of educators because I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Michele. Michele, please, uh, floor is yours. And let me remind uh, your promise. Uh, uh, you would like to tackle very interesting uh, issue, the difference between education and learning from a pedagogical perspective uh, and the implication related to distance and present education. Please. Thank you very much for the floor and thank you very much for being here. And actually, I'm quite in line with the uh, previous presentation like uh, Ahud and Marketan. So I will try to step a bit back uh, from the question. You know, we, you, we are talking about rethinking education and now we should think about what is education. And I think a general concept of education in many uh, points of view uh, from people outside of the educational context is like sort of learning at school, at university. But actually, there is also a bit of broader meaning of, uh, of education, which uh, I would like to present from a uh, side of philosopher uh, living at the end of the 19th century, Dabrindanat Tagore, which is a Bengali philosopher. And he said, education is enabling the mind to find out the ultimate truth with um, emancipates us from the bondage of the dust and gives us the wealth, not things, but inner light, not power, but love, making the truth its own and giving expression to it. So I think if we look at what we were thinking about education and COVID and what we are hearing now about the term education is a bit divergent. So I think this is a broader way and maybe we should not forget about also such a meaning of education. And on the other hand, I would like to talk about a little bit about the definition of learning. Naturally, from the, I think, general point of view, learning maybe have a, uh, has a concept of really 
acquiring knowledge, and I talk about rather factual knowledge or procedural knowledge, like learning is acquiring some specific knowledge. But actually, there are also other points of view where knowledge or learning can be seen as a sort of conceptual change, getting a conceptual change, and this conceptual change may be enhanced or facilitated by such sort of interaction like negotiating or argumenting or collaborating and resolve conflicts among peers and among peers and educators. So now I try, I come back to the idea of um, uh, COVID education or COVID, uh, education during COVID from these two points of view. What happens? Actually, we shifted education from school system, traditional education, to a digital online system, at least in our um, um, wealthy uh, countries like in Europe, in America, and in, in parts of Asia, in China, in parts of it. So what happens, actually? Did we really foster or did we enhance the concept of education I was mentioning before, the broader concept? Actually not. What happens, actually, that the part which is easy to transpose in a digital world, which is knowledge transposition, knowledge transmission, um, procedural and conceptual knowledge, that has been set in place. And a lot of kids, a lot of university students, they got uh, the opportunity to learn, to acquire specific knowledge in specific topic. But did they have the chance as well to learn about negotiating, to learn about arg argumenting, to, to learn about solving conflict? This has been forgotten. And this has been forgotten, I think, in most of the educational setting which were um, digitalized. And I think uh, this is the difference which was also mentioned by Ahout by saying, well, actually, by um, what uh, was fostered by COVID was the digitizing of education, which will, this noise transmission has been enhanced where it was possible, and the digitalization where other concepts of learning are addressed has been neglected to some extent. And I think if we want to have a prognosis, what should be done after COVID is trying to enhance such learning situation, like, like learning strategies online, offline, blended, however it is done, which really tries to foster this conceptual change, this, this notion of learning as a conceptual change. This notion of learning as a conceptual change can also be enhanced, uh, like uh, Martin mentioned, in project-based education, because project-based education is nothing else than really learning during doing projects. And during these projects, you have these activities which are crucial, collaborating, uh, um, knowledge construction or, or constructing something together, uh, argumentation, negotiation, and so on. So I think really we should consider um, before, during, and after this pandemic to enhance these capacities to learn in this way. And I think there are a lot of um, not only tools, but also concepts and methods which uh, enables uh, technology to foster these types of learning activities, which uh, enables to really to make this shift. That's it for the, for what I want to say. But I want to react a little bit um, to the chat. Well, uh, okay. So if you want to react on that, but I would like also afterwards to react to the chat uh, to the questions. Please, uh, please continue uh, with your reaction on chats. Well, actually, the point is I think I'm talking about the first world, about America, Europe, and so. But what happened in the in the third world, where they didn't have any uh, access to this technology. I'm actually assisting a project of uh, distance education in the Philippines, in the rural area, where actually the teacher said, we need printers. And I said, whoa, COVID, why you need printers? Because they don't have access to the network. They don't have access to technology. So they have to print out everything and then deliver by motorbike to the rural area. So, and there, of course, what are they delivering? They're delivering content. So they do the same thing in printers like we do with, or many of us do uh, by, by uh, making a PDF instead of printing out a paper or a script or whatever we want to do. So there, the, the problems are in another, uh, still in another point of view. But there, the solution for there is not a solution that happens now, but I think maybe there, or hopefully there, the connectivity will rise and there, to make it better there, the most important part should be to don't make the mistake we did. Namely, we, we floated the schools with computers and uh, connectivity, and we didn't educate the teachers. That, that means they didn't know what to do. And what they did, 
they instead of printing it, they made pay PDF and send it online. So that was the thing that the chance may be that such countries may have in investing now not only in technology but because the network and the com telecommunication strategies with the uh, smartphone they will come soon hopefully but really put a big effort and a lot of energy in teaching the educators about how to really enhance this um, this way of learning i was mentioning before not only content transmission not acquiring of factual and uh, procedural knowledge but really like project-based learning uh, settings the core constructive um, learning environments, all the things that may really help to solve the problems we need to solve in the next decade. So, sorry, that was it. Uh, thank you, Michele. Uh, just probably uh, minutes or two uh, for question to uh, one question to Michele uh, or just a uh, remark, please. Boom. Martin had a question Martin. for you. Please. Right. Um, Michele, thank you so, 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 thank you so much. Well, I think that uh, well, I agree with you that the essence of education consists in something deeper than just procedural knowledge. For example, in the room where I'm sitting, there is a photograph of my teacher there, who was uh, Professor Afmanov, who came here from the noble family. Her father was commandant of the Kremlin during Nikolai II, when, when Nicholas II, when he was Tsar. And actually, I got my education from her. And I consider my education is the education given to me by a man, by my mentor. And in, in this sense, uh, I think education consists of three big blocks, instructors, enlighteners, and mentors. But in the coming world, the part of mentors, I think, is dying out. Do you think the education will survive without the mentor part? It, the education may continue as an instruction part, or even as the enlightening, enlightening part. But without mentor, it will not survive. What do you think of it? I totally agree. Oh, sorry. Maybe you want to react. Uh, I hope before I react, you, you raise your hand. So maybe you just react yourself. And you have to unmute your microphone. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Please, but... brief. We have just uh, 13 minutes left and two speakers uh, ready. It's okay. You please, can go ahead. Please, Ahud. Please, please, Ahud. Uh, okay. So it's like uh, the problem here, it's not, it's not the mentor. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example. What is happening now, or what has hap uh, what what happened now, is like there is the community of people, the community of uh, ed for for my um, uh, community, the community of educations are gathering and collaborating in webinars in a very appreciative inquiry uh, mind uh, mindset. Um, uh, to learn, this is this is continuing. This is learning. Okay, it's uh, uh, learning doesn't stop. Education never stops, and it doesn't depend on a mentor, uh, because the mentors are the people around you. The uh, collaboration, the uh, interaction, uh, adding to each other. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's let's move further. Uh, Sandeep, please. Uh... Floor is yours. Uh, uh, yes, uh, a very. You promised uh, to say a few words about uh, experience in India. Yes. Uh, so good afternoon, and uh, let me directly get into the topic. Uh, I represent an organization which has education right from kindergarten up to PhD. So uh, yes, so we are, we are at the all end of the education spectrum, and. Uh, uh, like the other speaker, I am also into uh, other uh, corporate activities, startups, funding, and real estate. So I'm on both sides of the spectrum as such. So uh, if, if you talk of um, the COVID-19 effect, it has totally disrupted our lives and education also in complete way. In India, we have been in a lockdown right from April. So it's six months now we are in a lockdown. And it's, uh, it looks like another two months before the government will allow us to open up. So uh, all of us were forced to go for online education. People have adapted and moved towards blended, uh, learn, uh, this fully digital learning rather. Uh, however, when this comes in, I'm an optimist. And I, I, I firmly believe what Einstein said, every crisis provides an opportunity. So I think the term, you know, the coronization of education uh, has led us to rethink, reimagine, reboot, and rethink our complete education. And what a better time for this when the government of India 
has come up with a new national education policy after 34 years. Now, uh, this policy is totally going to revolutionize the, and revamp the traditional education system. It removes the rote learning. It, it changes the way of uh, uh, examination patterns. It, it brings in activity-based learning. You know, we talked about uh, project-based learning. So they are trying to get an internship right from grade eight into the curriculum. Uh, they are talking of removing the language barriers. So it's going to be multi-language and multidisciplinary. Uh, so it's, it's a very forward thinking policy, which uh, looks at even giving the students a choice. So they don't want to break the students into silos like engineering, science, arts, uh, uh, say architecture. So they're giving a freedom for a student to choose whatever subject. And another step they're saying is this can happen with multiple entry and exit points. So instead of completing your education from a particular university, you could just pick up some credits from that university. They're going to create a credit bank. And once you reach a number of credits, then you get that graduation or degree or whatever. So yes, it's, it's extremely new. It, it gives a loads of emphasis on use of technology. However, in a country like India, it poses a number of challenges. Now, uh, the digital divide is there. We have been talking about the devices. Yes, students have the mobile phones or the internet, but studying on a laptop and a mobile are two different things. Plus, the houses are small in India. Do they really can get a quiet corner to go and study or attend the online lectures? Probably not. And the most important problem I see is the training of the teachers because they are the ones who have to adapt to this. And with millions of teachers, I don't know how that's going to happen now. You know, I agree with what the other speakers had said, Ahut and others, that yes, teaching online is different, but online teaching is a different world altogether. <laughs> uh, you need a different mindset. You need the right tools. You need to do loads of preparations. So it has to be engaging. It has to be active. It has to be social. Then only you can have the attention of the students as such. Uh, and does the one size fit all work for a large country like India? So though the intent of the policy is very good, it brings loads of innovation. But the question is how it will be implemented and how it will be interpreted are the two different things. Uh, since I'm into even higher education, uh, we do focus a lot on outcome based competency based learnings. At our institute, we have started courses in association with the industry. So the courses are co-created, co-developed and co-delivered with the industry. Uh, we have tie ups with Amazon, Microsoft, uh, you know, uh, SAP. Uh, so what we have seen is the gap, what Mikhail uh, talked about, uh, is not there in our students because uh, we are getting the industry to teach what they require. And the courses are made by doing a proper competency planning as such. So I think as the world is going ahead, the role of education is to prepare the students for the future. And that's our biggest challenge because we don't know how it's going to be. 60% of the jobs will be which don't exist today. So that's going to be a big challenge. So we have to teach our students creativity, innovation, problem solving, critical uh, you know, thinking and collaboration skills. And this is what I think all of us are trying to do. Uh, I think blended and hybrid way is the way forward. Uh, I was very optimistic when I talk about EdTech. Uh, in fact, my son, who is 14 year old tomorrow, is launching a company which is going to ensure that he provides a platform to teach these skills. Uh, and he's going to give support to the national education policy as such. So I think uh, uh, to end up, COVID has given us a good opportunity and we will not only look at education just for uh, the st students, but we have to look at it like a lifelong learning and we have to see even how we can reskill, upskill and even new skill the existing workforce. And my last point is that uh, I think there should be a focus on morals and ethics in education, because if we are creating, uh, you know, students without uh, morals, we are probably creating a menace to the society. 
so we should not lose that uh, human touch we should not lose that traditional uh, things what uh, we are known for uh, and just uh, you know harp only on technology but embrace technology as an enabler as a driver and as a facilitator thank you <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sandeep. And uh, we have just five minutes ahead. And uh, let me go straight to Jim. Uh, Jim mentioned that uh, he would like to be a free agent. Uh, and uh, moving through all topics uh, uh, here uh, uh, would hurt uh, would hear from uh, from from us. Please, Jim. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to build on what Sandeep mentioned. I think very good points around technology around lifeline learning, I absolutely agree, around uh, uh, education and using using technology for this. I, I think, um, and, and then also just to build on some of the points that other panelists made, I think you know, technology at the end of the day, it's a tool, it's a platform, but ultimately what is our purpose? What is our goal for it? And uh, I like to postulate one of uh, the goals being learning from mistakes and failures. I think that, that institutional education in particular has drilled us from, from birth till and graduation that, you know, that oftentimes it's about making sure you get the, the right grades, making sure you're not making enough mistakes in order to get the grade. And, uh, granted, things are changing. You know, we, we, we realize that um, Education is left lifelong, as Sandeep mentioned. We we realize that there is there's project based learning as a better way compared to rote learning. But I I I do believe that there, there's still a very far road ahead in terms of that evolution. In terms of students as lifelong learn, learn, learners, understanding and also embracing that learning from mistakes and failures, not being afraid to. F it up, uh, excuse my excuse my language. I think there there are um, there was a movement that started in Mexico City called F up nights, where entrepreneurs and everyone would talk about how they have really effed it up in their own experiences, and that is a as a conduit for further learning because one cannot truly learn and advance oftentimes without really effing it up very badly. And that that learning. Uh, cannot happen without falling down and picking oneself back up. And oftentimes, that doesn't take place in a classroom. That doesn't take place in the in the textbook. Another point, uh, just to build on some of the, the the great points that the fellow panelists made, um, I want to bring up is the the idea of dealing with ambiguity. That the world is, you know, as Sandeep and others mentioned, it's it's changing. Um, Michael Lynn also mentioned you know, it's changing very fast. That uh, a world in the 21st century is not the world of, of the past. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future. As many uh, panelists also mentioned, that the, the idea of dealing with the ambiguity, not just uh, assessing what the uh, outcome is, but also what is the problem that we're trying to solve? What is exactly the problem? What is the question that we want to really ask ourselves and for the students themselves to ask? And sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's the unknown unknowns that really, really scare us and that really... Um, we don't what we don't know about, and dealing with that because it's a very imperfect world. I think that oftentimes the education systems that we grew up in pretends or um, allows us to pretend that the world is neat, everything's in modules that we can assess it, we can uh, look at the outcomes. But in, ultimately, the world is such an imperfect place that um, we don't know about. Um, we, we we don't know everything about the universe and where we come from, where we go, and uh, dealing, For, learning how to deal with the ambiguity. Fortunately, and dealing with that ambiguity and having students to be brave enough to tackle that ambiguity and, and being able to admit that they're wrong. And it's, it's okay to really F it up. And uh, if, 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 if what they can learn is from these mistakes and be able to pick themselves up, I think, uh, it can take us further ahead in terms of where education is going. We have just uh, 30 minutes and uh, um, do you have, or anyone has uh, any final, final remarks uh, about our uh, post-COVID education rekindling? I think you had a very good talk. Lots of decisions. <laughs> 
And we should, we should have a follow-up. Thank you. Follow -up. It was diverse, uh, very diverse, uh, and uh, not boring. Not boring. So thank you very much. Thank uh, you. See you, I hope, in presence. Okay, of course. Yeah, we, uh, yes, uh, now we are out of uh, the stream. Uh, so if you would like uh, to tell something else, uh, uh, please. Maybe I didn't answer the question of Marklin who said, you know, what's going on with the tutoring and, of course, the iconic uh, professors we had and were, which inspired us for, for our future, whatever goals and things. And I think this is both is very important, having some idols and that can be music in gaming like it is today or in YouTubing and for uh, for academic study in professors and tutoring is crucial but what is the, the what is the aim of the tutor? Tutor is actually a specific uh, feedback mechanism if you look at it from a mechanical point of view and having an adequate specific feedback mechanism can, does not really have to come from a sort of a teacher it can come from a peer it can, it can come to, from a artificial intelligence bot, it can come from a teacher, it can come from a YouTuber. So the thing is actually where education will lead. Of course, you have to set up like a digitalized learning environments where tutoring is crucial. And, but tutoring can be given by different agencies. That's the thing that that's where I think it should go to. Uh, thank you, Michele. Thank Something you. else? Uh, well said. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank so, you thank you very much you. have a nice day and nice day. i hope uh, we will see each other in presence um, in the next in, in the next uh, forum no no awesome. it will be june 6th or something uh next year june 6th in kashkai yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay yeah. Hope, hope, hope can travel by then yeah yes, there's a there's a group uh groupy if you want to take a photo, um, put yeah. for the, a, a selfie. How? Let's let's do it. I think it, it's there. Just I think you just have to click the the button to take the group P, and it, it uh, the software the platform automatically groups it together, and you'll receive the group P in the email. And I think we definitely had a less boring meeting than others. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was interactive. It was great. Good points. Okay, we did it. We did awesome. it. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. I guess we can still reuse the room. <laughs>